Thanks to first-hand accounts, this program tells the story of women who've been part of Italy's Camorra Mafia. Some chose to collaborate and are now protected in secret locations. Other women opted not to collaborate with the state and are currently serving their full sentences in jail. My name is Maria Doraccio. I spent most of my life as a mafia queen within the Camorra. I am now collaborating with the state. My dream is to see my son succeed in life. Maria Duraccio's story begins in a small town at the foot of the Vesuvius. This is where Maria spends her childhood, a surrounding that seems perfectly normal through the eyes of a child. I come from a very normal family. We celebrated together. If any problems showed up, the family would come together to discuss them. We were very close. Other people were jealous of how close we were. There was a Catholic school run by nuns right across the street from where I lived. I used to go to that school. I led a very normal life. But the environment in which she is raised is far from normal. Ottaviano, a small district near Naples, is home to Raffaele Cutolo, also known as the teacher. The boss of all bosses, one of the most important and dreaded criminals of Italy's recent history. From the prison of Poggio Reale, he establishes the NCO, the newly organized Camorra the clan which during the 70s and 80s transformed the criminal scene in the Campania region. In the 80s, Ottaviano was a rural setting, but thanks to Raffaele Cutolo, the area soon faces an increasing crime rate. He becomes the spokesperson of the local criminal groups. They are trying to fend off an increasing presence of Sicilian clans. The Sicilians have come to the Campania region to control the most profitable illegal activity at the time, the smuggling of cigarettes. But the NCO, Raffaele Cutolo's newly organized Camorra, isn't the only clan present in and around Ottaviano. There were two families who controlled the territory. On one side, there was Mario Fabricino's clan, and on the other, Raffaele Cutolo's. Sometimes their rivalry would become an actual blood feud which was often carried out through the use of weapons. Between the late 70s and early 80s, Ottaviano becomes the setting for one of the Camorra's bloodiest wars. At the time, Maria is still too young to understand what's going on around her. She doesn't know that the war which is covering the streets of Ottaviano with blood involves her family as well. In the 80s, Maria Duraccio was still a little girl. Her family used to maintain very close ties with the NCO. Maria Duraccio is the niece of Giovanni Duraccio, who is her father's brother. He was well respected within the Cutolo clan and was a member of an important group of the NCO. In fact, her uncle, Giovanni Duraccio, organizes an ambush at Maria's father's house, 
targeted at Francesco Fabrocino, one of the most influential men within the rival clan. Hello? For Giovanni? We found him. We're all set. In 1980, Francesco Fabrocino is shot dead by members of the Cutolo clan while he is taking his kids to school. Despite appearances, Maria's family isn't normal at all. Quite the opposite. She eventually comes to realize this. When my uncle and the others came to our house, my father sent us out. We weren't allowed to stay and listen to their conversations. Obviously, something illegal was going on. Unlike myself in the years to come, my father wasn't involved in drugs or extortion. As opposed to my uncle, he wasn't involved in murders of any kind either. No, my father was a hard-working man, and he always put his family first. Maria Duraccio's father wasn't like his brother Giovanni. But in those years, it wasn't easy trying to be neutral, especially not in Ottaviano. You were either on Raffaele Cutolo's side or you were against him. It was simply impossible not to take sides in the war in Ottaviano. A war in which between the late 70s and early 80s, over 3,000 people were killed on the streets. This is why the state decided it was time to strike back. In June 1983, the police conducted a raid against the newly organized Camorra. This operation led to the arrest of more than 800 members. The police raid officially puts an end to the clan and is meant to send out a clear message to all. But the big shots weren't the only ones sent to jail. Maria's father came under arrest too. Informants had accused him of being involved in extortion. My father was arrested because false informants had testified against him. I insist on the fact that these were false penitents. At only 11 years of age, Maria is separated from her father, her one and only point of reference in life. Her peaceful and happy childhood ends abruptly. It was a very negative experience for me when my father went to jail. I'd visit him in prison, in Poggio Reale, but it wasn't the sort of experience a child would enjoy. I couldn't accept the fact that my father was behind bars. I really missed having him around. This emptiness becomes unbearable, and it will take some years before her prayers are answered at last. In 1986, Maria is finally able to hug her father again. After three years of detention, he is a free man once again. 
A business owner was called to testify against those people that had accused my father of extortion. This man stated that he had never seen my father before. Therefore, my father was acquitted on all charges and was found innocent. Now that her father has finally come home, Maria can leave those difficult years behind and try to live her teenage years in a peaceful way. A few years have gone by since the blood feud in Ottaviano took place. Maria is no longer a naive girl, she's almost a woman. Her looks and her personality have changed too. She has become a difficult and rebellious teenager who only her father is able to control. My father liked the way I did things, even if he often disagreed with me and tried to change my ways. There was great complicity between us. I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to have his strength and determination. He was very humble and always wanted to do good. Maria very much enjoys the special relationship she has with her father. But soon she will have to give it up, this time forever. In the afternoon of January 4th, 1989, Maria's father leaves home to head off to the bakery. But on that day, someone is waiting for him outside of his house. We heard the first gunshots and my mother turned to me and said, they're killing your father. One of the men pointed a gun to my face and the other beat me violently, leaving me lying on the ground. And then they just left me there. I was in a complete state of shock. I couldn't believe my father was gone forever. The murder of her father was nothing but an execution in line with the clan's code of honor. A revenge for the murder of Francesco Fabrocino, which had taken place nine years ago and had been planned at her father's house. Maria doesn't even have time to cry. The investigators know that she's the only one who saw the gunman's faces, so they decide to bring her to a safe place. I was brought to a nunnery because my life was in danger. She testified as a cooperating informant. She told us later that she had actually been offered protection, but at the time the law didn't provide appropriate protection for witnesses and justice collaborators. They started asking me questions and showing me pictures. I told them those weren't the men who killed my father. I was terrified they would attack my family. I never testified. The trial against my father's murders never even came to court. 
Maria refuses to testify against her father's killers. She knows well that it would be tantamount to sentencing her entire family to death. Maria wants to forget everything and start a new life, even if she has to do it without the most important person. For my family, it meant we had to start all over again. We had lost the right balance to deal with our everyday difficulties. Because the most important person was missing, the one that had provided the balance before. My father was everything to me. He was the best. I just couldn't accept the fact that he was dead. It made no sense to me. After the trauma of her father's death, Maria tries in every way to lead a normal life. Far away from Ottaviano's criminal environment. After graduating from high school, she decides to go to university. I started studying religious science to get a degree. I wanted to understand why there was so much evil in the world. I was looking for answers in books. Maria is also seeking emotional stability in a relationship. She finds it when she meets Giovanni Gatto, an honest worker. Giovanni owned a business selling air conditioners and heaters. He was doing pretty well. Maria is 25 now. She's finally leading a calm and normal life, just like many other young women of her age. In 1997, after many years of relationship, they decide to get married. A few months later, they find out she's pregnant with a boy. News that make the couple very happy. But this feeling of happiness doesn't last for too long. <laughs> Ultrasonic testings show that the child suffers from a serious malformation. A dramatic discovery forcing them to take a decision even if, in truth, Maria has already made up her mind. Religion teaches us that from the first day of conception, the mother and the father have no right to take their child's life. I had no right to take my son's life. Maria doesn't even consider the possibility of having an abortion. I don't want to do this. What don't you want to do? Listen to me, Wormans. Giovanni doesn't accept her decision. Listen to me for once. I'm the man. What are you trying to say? I don't want a baby like this. I don't want this baby. Maria decides not to listen to her husband. In March 1998, she gives birth to a boy with a serious disability. The newborn baby needs to undergo surgery in order to live. My son received treatment at the hospital. We brought him to a world-famous doctor. But for some reason, he couldn't operate on my son in the hospital. Maria knows she's running out of time. Her son needs immediate surgery at whatever cost. She decides to ask the only important person she knows for help. Rosetta Cutolo, Raffaele's sister, boss of the newly organized Camorra. I met Rosetta Cutolo through my aunt, my uncle Giovanni's wife. Cutolo was in jail, and Rosetta, who looked like a humble woman, was enormously powerful. She had taken over her brother's place as leader of the newly organized Camorra. For Raffaella Cutolo, Rosetta represented the main link to his widespread criminal organization. Uh, 
ha sempre gestito la She was the one who managed the group's cash flow. She was always the one in charge of the flow of information to and from the prison, in which Raffaele Cutolo spent most of his lifetime. I still don't know who she actually called, but my son was in the hospital the following day. That world-famous doctor operated on him. I owe that woman so much, both her and her brother, Raffaele Cutolo. They both helped my son during his sickness. They helped him a lot. These people helped her get in touch with the doctors who then cured her son. This brings us back to the topic of criminal organizations taking on the state's role of protecting social interests, a field where institutions do not fulfill expectations and thus help criminal organizations gain influence and take over control of a territory. Thanks to the help of the Cutolo family, her son gets better day by day. Maria can finally breathe a sigh of relief. She knows she won't be able to continue on without the help of her influential friends, especially since her marriage had broken up. It was a love-hate relationship. You're being too loud. Shut up. Be quiet. You hold your mouth. He was never around. So at a certain point, we decided to go our separate ways. What? Shut up. Here. I don't need your money, you piece of shit. Maria knows she can't count on her husband. She seeks help among her old friends on the streets of Ottaviano. I need to talk to you. What do you want? Maria needs money. She needs to feel safe. She needs the clan. They knew I was from Ottaviano. We all knew each other. It was me who went looking for them. They understood I was hard-headed and rebellious and was able to do certain things. So they would ask me to do things and I always accepted also because I enjoy doing them. Maria begins her criminal activity with extortion. The clan sends her to collect protection money from shopkeepers. The beast that was inside of me kept on rebelling, shouting. It wanted to break free. I tried to spend my time differently, but I failed. I was able to graduate, but I wasn't able to stop doing certain other things. I just couldn't resist. She immediately proves to them she's up to the tasks they give her. This is why her role within the clan grows more important day by day. 
Maria Duraccio has always lived in two parallel worlds. She studied theology and got a degree as a social health worker. She was a single mum to a child in need of special care. But then again, she didn't feel any kind of remorse regarding her criminal activity. I started to get close to important people, to do them favors. I was a drug runner and delivered weapons to people. Despite her intense criminal activity, she never neglects her son, who's getting older and is in constant need of special care. It was my destiny to carry this cross. No, not true. My son never was a burden to me. My fate was to carry this star of mine through life. And sometimes there's light in life, and sometimes darkness surrounds you. But children are never a burden. Other things are. She certainly received help from Rosetta Cutolo. But still she felt as if she was entitled to take whatever she needed for her son, even if it meant oppressing, attacking or threatening other people. And her son had many needs. Maria knows this kind of life is likely to expose her son to serious dangers, but she doesn't want to back down and give up the prestige and power she has earned within the group. Her power is destined to increase even more, especially after she meets the man who will change her life forever. Michele Auriema. Michele Auriema was a young man who had approached the newly organized Camorra. He was fascinated by its system and its control. He becomes one of Raffaele Cutolo's confidants and one of his killers. I'd heard a lot of talk about Auriema. He was an important man within the clan. In July 2007, Michele Auriemma is temporarily released from jail. He'd been found guilty of murder and has spent a few years behind bars. He decides to take over control of the criminal activities in Ottaviano. You understand? Did someone explain it to you? Did you understand? You understand? Good boy. Get out of here. I met him in February 2007 during a release on temporary license. When we met, he immediately understood there was a beast inside me ready to attack. And very quickly we noticed the special chemistry between us. Maria is well aware that Auriemma could be very useful for her criminal career. The two begin a relationship that goes way beyond business. When I met Michele, he had already separated from his wife. So there was nothing to stop us from having a relationship.
Maria's prayers have been answered. She has finally met a man who's able to fill the void she's been living with for so long. Ever since the day they took her father from her. The news that Michaela Oriema has reappeared on the scene doesn't just draw Maria's attention. Her ex-husband, Giovanni Gator, also wants to take advantage of a new acquaintance. Giovanni Gatto joined us because he had decided to quit working. He had decided to become a member of the Camorra. He decided to do whatever Michaela told him to. The number of men under Auriemma's command increased day by day, and so do the clan's criminal activities. I had to ask for protection money. While he bought cocaine, hash, weed. I passed them on to the men who were responsible for the trafficking. I collected the money that went straight to the clan's coffers. Maria isn't a simple clan member anymore. She's the girlfriend of the most influential boss in Ottaviano. The clan's most important business operations are carried out by her. Maria Doracho's criminal activities draw the attention of investigators. I clearly remember her using a specific metaphor when collecting the protection money. You have to give me a flower. The members of the Cudolo clan had used that same expression years ago. Duracho was also responsible for the transport of concealed weapons that belonged to Michele Auriemma and his criminal group. Maria finds herself in the middle of a huge business producing a load of cash that Auriemma must protect from his enemies, especially from another important clan in Ottaviano. Auriemma turned against Fabrocino's clan. Initially, they had agreed on splitting the control over the territory. One part belonged to him, and the other was theirs. Then Michele decided to break this pact and asked shopkeepers and business owners for protection money. Auriemma not only worries about his enemies, the boss still has unfinished business with the law. After his temporary release, he has actually never returned to prison. So from that moment on, he is officially a fugitive, one of the most wanted fugitives in the Campania region. Everything all right? Everything's fine. Let's go. Are you all right, honey? We had to constantly move him from one place to the next. We were always on the alert. Did the doorbell ring or not? Had we heard a knock on the door or hadn't we? 
were police in the neighborhood, or weren't they? We always had to be on the lookout. It was constant stress. This woman is everything to him, his lover, his wife, but also his mother, because she was the one taking care of him. But still, Ariema never even budges an inch when it comes to controlling his territory. In a way, Michele Auriema was trying to create the old NCO, but this time without Raffaele Cutolo's fellow fighters. Michele Auriema's intention wasn't exactly to recreate the NCO. He wanted to create something new, but he was inspired by that group. He followed the NCO's code of honor and used the same methods to control the territory. What happened? I'm scared. What if they arrest you? Don't worry. He knows he's playing with fire. Their idea was to split Ottaviano's territory in half, but this was clearly their concept alone. The other clan had no such intentions. They had never, ever shared anything at all. Auriemma wants to restore the old balance in Ottaviano. But in order to achieve this, he first has to get rid of all his potential enemies. Nicola Smarazzo is one of them. He was a drug dealer who ran into a clash of interests with Michele Auriemma's new group because he ran the sale of drugs in an area Michele Auriemma wanted to control himself. Voleva essere controllato dallo stesso Auriemma Michele. Auriemma closely monitors his enemy. He wants to know his exact whereabouts and movements before he takes action. The first move depends on Giovanni Gattor, who approaches Marazzo with an excuse. Smarazzo was drawn into a trap by Gatto, who up to then hadn't been in any way associated with the Camorra, nor had he been involved in any sort of criminal activities. So that's why he was able to get very close to Smarazzo. Gattor convinces Smarazzo to follow him into an old abandoned house along the slopes of the Vesuvius. Michele Auriemma is awaiting him there. Mm. While Auriemma and his men get rid of Smarazzo's body, Gator is sent to Maria's house to hide the weapons. He brought the weapons to my house in order to hide them there. I went there, but I hadn't realized they had actually killed someone. What's going on? Tell me what's going on. Let's get out of here. Don't worry. When Maria arrives at the crime scene, Auriemma is able to calm her down. He doesn't tell her about the murder. But murdering Smarazzo has been a serious mistake, and it will lead to severe consequences for Ottaviano's boss. In November 2007, Smarazzo was reported missing by his family. La 
His death and disappearance was a wake-up call for the investigators. It was pretty clear to us that he hadn't gone missing voluntarily. In that situation, we realized that the person responsible for this act might be a well-known previous offender, Michele Ariema. The investigators come to the conclusion that Michele Auriemma is responsible for Smarazzo's disappearance. On January 3rd, 2008, Ottaviano's police decide to take action and bring Auriemma to justice. Several men and police cars are sent out, convoyed by a helicopter. The helicopter arrived at the house where Ariema was hiding. Then we stormed the house. He made an attempt to escape to the nearby countryside. We conducted a search for Michele Ariema, and after about 30 or 40 minutes, the police were able to track him down. They stood face to face with Michele Ariema. He finally surrendered without putting up a fight or another attempt at escaping. For Maria, it is like reliving a nightmare. Once again, the most important man in her life is sent to prison. A few days later, it's her turn as well. Investigators accuse her of covering up his hiding, and they suspect she might know something about Smarazzo's death. For Maria, the day of reckoning has arrived. When Maria Duraccio arrived here, she didn't have quite a collaborative attitude. She decided to keep quiet and not to say a word. Maria knows that her partner is facing a heavy sentence. This is why she decides not to collaborate at first. It is actually Auriemma who convinces her that she has no choice but to collaborate. She had the chance to talk to him once or twice before she finally decided to collaborate. Nobody forced us. We chose to do it. It's a choice you have to make. It's either black or white. You either collaborate or you don't. I'm only doing this for my son. I was lucky enough to meet Simona Di Monte, who was the magistrate. We didn't make any kind of pact. The only agreement we had was that my disabled son would be protected. I made this decision for him. I'll tell you everything, and I'm actually happy about it. Ask me all you want. I always had the feeling that Maria Duraccio was a lioness defending her cub. She would have done anything to save the boy. Maria made her decision. Her and Michela Oriema's confessions from 2008 and 2009 put a stop to the formation of a new clan that could have led to blood feuds on the streets of Ottaviano. Following her collaboration, Maria and her son were transferred under false identity to a secret location where they still live today. 
At first it was tough. Whoever lives under protection must follow the state's rules. It's not exactly a picnic. You stop being a member of the Camorra by dying or by changing identity, which in a way is like dying. Because you give up your entire previous life completely and you take on a new role. My dream is to see my son succeed in life, in school, with a family, a home and a job. I want my son to succeed in life. Maria Duraccio is currently on trial for extortion, international drug trafficking, illegal possession of weapons and involvement with a mafia. After eight years behind bars, Michela Oriemma was able to join Maria and her son. They are currently living together under protection. <laughs>